Hey, welcome to the Harry Man Show number 30, where I have a really special guest, someone I looked up playing in the last decade or so, Chad Saliga. How are you doing, Chad? How are you doing? Yeah, great. Uh, Chad's playing in bands like Breaking Benjamin, Black Label Society, and right currently you're playing with Black Star Riders, is that correct? Uh, I am doing Black Star Riders. I have another band called uh, Weapons of a New. Oh, that's the other one I was talking about, yeah. And uh, that, that, that's a rock metal band, if I'm, I'm correct? Yeah, and then my other band, Walking with Lions, but I've been doing Weapons of a New full time now. Oh, nice, nice. And, um... So how you doing? You're a little bit on the East Coast, there's a little bit on the cold side. How you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, yeah, we officially are in, in the fall era now. Um, we are in the l- low 40s right now. Nice, nice. And then next week's going to be 60, so who knows? <laughs> yeah, it's bouncing around. But uh, yeah, let's kind of back it up. Uh, you grew up in Ohio, correct? Correct. And um, what got you into? I know. I know. Your, was your father a drummer as well, or did you have a member that, that kind of passed it along uh, to you? Yeah, a lot of people ask me that question, like, what you know inspired me to drum, and I said drums picked me. I didn't pick drums. <laughs> That's the good, good Lord <laughs> That's uh, cool. put sticks in my hand, said you're going to be a drummer. So what? What was it like? Something you saw, or was it something you heard that kind of got you into it? Or <laughs> well. My grandfather played trombone for Tommy Dorsey. Oh, nice. Um, and I believe Glenn Miller and a little bit of Buddy Rich. And he played big band. So I gravitated towards that at an early, t- you know, uh, part of my life. I was watching drummers like Buddy Rich, where my grandfather would make me watch him playing with the Boston Pops. And, you know, I fell in love with drums. I gravitated towards it at a very, very, very early age. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's pictures when I was two hitting things. Yeah. Now, mind you, hitting things, not playing, (laughs) you know, (laughs) you know, actual drum grooves, not even understanding what I'm playing. But at a a very early age, I did start. And you can totally hear that in your snare rolls to the Buddy Rich. I mean, that's something I pointed out with your accents and you you punctuate. Thank you. You punctuate very well with your snare breaks and all that stuff. So I wanted to point that out to you. Yeah, thank you so much. My grandfather, after he got out of the service, uh, began to teach drum corps. So at eight, nine, ten years old, I'd go and watch his marching band, and they would teach me back sticking and all the rudiments. And before I could even play drums, per se, he gave me a drum pad. Well, my grandma did. Um, And my grandfather said, you have to learn rudiments. Now, my mom played she was a flautist and she was going to play for the cleveland orchestra but she had me so she got more in the teaching aspect uh over the years and then my dad just drummed for fun never professionally but i always looked up to him because he had such a unique like ginger baker style yeah yeah and that's does that kind of come in place with your tom set up there a little bit because i noticed you always you always have your your high tom on the right side there yeah so a lot of people ask me my configuration, like, why do I set it up like that, right? Mm-hmm. And three different things. One, it looks completely different than the traditional drum set. Mm-hmm. Um, two, from, like, marching band. Oh, the tenors. Actually, there's four. And then the third is I always like doing fills backwards. I don't know. Maybe it's the Polish in me. <laughs> um, but I always like to do stuff backwards on the drum because I think it sounds cool starting with the floor tom and then working your way up to the higher tom. Yeah, yeah. And it was a challenge to go from like a 10 to an 8. Instead of an 8, 10, 12, the way I have it set up is 8, 12, 10. Now, if you look at it, the main drum is your 12. The 14 is my floor. It's actually a four piece kit at that point. Those other toms on the side are for accent. Mm-hmm. If I used the 10, the 10 would have been my main drum. Yeah. So now it makes you think differently. And then I look at it as the fourth thing, 
is when I had power toms back in the day, I wanted to lower the toms and I couldn't to yeah. get it the 12 where I needed it to be. So I put it over on the other side and I could lower it as low as I wanted to go. Yeah. And that's kind of been my thing. And watching like drummers, like, I don't know, Bernard Purdy, Lenny White, Kenny Arnoff does it. Um, uh, what you call it? Um, Anika Niles. Does Don, it now. Don Flamero. Yeah. Sam Yeah. Or, he, the, yeah, I know you talking about the guy that uses main picks and saving. He's a great drummer as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of great ones. Yeah. And then, I do it. Is that the reason why you use a smaller kick too to get that, that, that lower feel to the set as well? I was playing a 20 for many, many, many years. Uh-huh. And then uh, about three years now I've been playing. Well, when I got with Black Label, I started playing a 22. Oh, nice. That makes sense. And, um, um, well, I'll back, yeah. I'll back up a little bit here before we get into that. I kind of asked, but what was your first kit going into? It was something that you kind of pieced together or was given to you? Now, here's the crazy story. So the first kit that I was given to was from a parent, my dad. And he got it from my next door neighbor and it was an old camp go. Oh, nice. My first actual kit kit mm-hmm. was a rock star Tama. Oh, the good so ones. now I'm with Tama. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The good ones. Those are actually going for a pretty penny now. If you can find them. <laughs> of course they are. Yeah. Mine is trash somewhere, but it probably still will sound amazing. Yeah. And what were they, the power tom sizes? Did you have the, you know, the big... Four? Oh, yeah. it was Dave Gruel's exact same setup. Oh, really? So you had the 14 in front of you and the 18 on the right? Yeah. Before <laughs> Nirvana was Nirvana. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. You know, side note, yeah. side note, he was actually using an export scenario to those recordings. That's what I found out later on. Did he really? Yeah. The, the, those are actually, when he recorded uh, the two big albums, uh, I don't want to say it wrong, but it was, he was using a uh, 5x14 export snare. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you learn something new every day. <laughs> yeah, so I thought that was pretty cool. And we used to joke about those snares, but turns out they're you know, kind of iconic at this point, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that snare's worth a lot of money now. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, with that setup, did, did you was that a 24-inch kick or a 22-inch kick on it? 22 by 18, and now recently I've been playing 22 by 16. Oh, nice. So... You stuck with that kit for a while. What kind of bands and music were you listening to as you were learning to play on that kit? Uh, you know, I've always been in the funk and jazz. Yeah, I can hear and that. And I've always liked the tightness of a 20. Mm-hmm. And b- believe it or not, Dave Silver is the one that got me into playing a 20. Not that I've hung out with David or toured with him. I just saw that his kick was a 20 and I'm like, wait a minute. If I can get a 20, it doesn't matter what size Tom, I can go as low as I want. Are you talking about Dave from corn or? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, he always kind of had that small kick with his gong, uh, Tom's on it. He had a really cool setup. as well. Yeah. He had a unique style. So I kind of like that kick drum sound. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I always thought Abe from Deftones had a 20. Nice, because yeah. of that super quick punch before I learned what samples were <laughs> on record. <laughs> yeah. He's a great drummer as well, though, too. There's just still a couple of oh, shuffle, I love him. A couple of shuffles for like Digital Bath I still play around with when I warm up and stuff. And really good stuff to play with. Do you know how he really plays that song? As far as, uh, what do you mean, though? On, on the hi hat. Yeah, I've seen when, different, different variations yeah. of it. He uses his foot like a Steve Gadd thing. Really? And once you see him play it, you will have even more respect for that man. I probably have. I just not realized it. But I, I, I grew up. That was one of my guys growing up. You know, like Deftones. Yeah, Abe, so. one of my faves. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, I could talk. I could geek out on those guys all day. But more importantly, I, uh, so after after your first band was a band called Switched, right? Correct. And yep. Then, and then, how long did you did you stay with those guys? Uh, we got signed in. 2000 i was in it till maybe 2004 Mm -hmm. and that was a rock band as well or a funk band yeah a metal band oh nice so when you played a metal were you were you uh messing around with two kicks or a double pedal at the time or was that kind of foreign no dude i 
I mean, I don't even co- claim I'm a, a double bass guy ever. Um, <laughs> but uh, people say I play it pretty well. So I, I think so. I guess I'll... <laughs> Thank you. But yeah. yeah, so I never liked double bass. I was always a single, like Dom Bonham. If you can't do it with one, you can't do it with two. Yeah, the doctor. Um, yeah, so I really worked on my single foot first. And after when I uh, got Black Label, I practiced eight hours a day yeah. with weights on, on my feet. That's what I did um, myself. I was, I was yeah, like, it, it, it works great, like Gene Hoglin method. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but yeah, I mean. It, no. Uh, the weights are, I use the wrist weights, the two and a half pounders, and that, that makes a tremendous, too. tremendous difference. After doing that for about an hour, taking them off, then putting them back on, it, it, I highly recommend doing that. It, it totally works, but you got to be careful at the same time because I could, you know, weigh down your wrist a little bit with the shock, I've noticed. Yeah, I, uh, I'm having some problems with myself with the wrist weights. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll do like five or ten minutes with the wrist and work my hands. And then the six feel like toothpicks. Yeah, it almost works against you a little bit too. It's almost hard. Yeah, it's yeah. more hard. Yeah, yeah. but um, I think well, back to your double bass thing. I I've never really had double bass until I got Black Label, but I had a dummy double bass kit. I always played a single pedal. Uh huh. Um, but my first, I mean, I've been in rock bands most of my career. Uh huh. Um, and when I got with Switch. When I did an audition with those guys, I didn't know what it meant to ride on a crash. Huh. I I had three rides at my at my audition, <laughs> and they're like, "What ride on a crash?" I go, no, "You can't ride. On, I ride on a ride." So <laughs> it it was it was like, "Sad, go do some homework. You got the gig, but." Pantera, like Pantera. So you got that, to that first Davis and stuff. You got that first heavy hand kind of riding through the song feel with those guys. Yeah, I mean, I really learned rock. My dad was a rock guy, um, but I gravitated towards punk because I went through a CD collection. I found a band called Tower of Power, and then I was like, oh, "Forget go. Meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like this band." All right, and then- so. One thing, um, so going into Breaking Benjamin, there's a funny story I've heard from, I think I've even heard it from you about the VHS tape, like you rushed down and got that audition straight into him. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, when I was with Switch, I was signed with Vader Drumstick. Mm-hmm. And um, at that time, I would call Chad Brandolini or all my endorsees and say, hey, you know, if anyone's looking for a drummer, please mention my name. Mm -hmm. Well, months and months and months and months go on. And finally I get a call and Chad Brandolini of all people, uh, that I'm in debt to. Mm -hmm. Um, he basically said breaking Benjamin just lost their drummer and they're having auditions. Mm -hmm. Here's the drum text number. So I was like, great. So I'm learning the songs as I'm almost basically recording them. Mm -hmm. And I did it at my church and my ex-wife was like, why don't you do it like a show? And we didn't, I mean, DVDs were out at that time. So you could get a decent camcorder. But when we converted it, my buddy didn't have something happened. So he only can make VHS. And I was like, all right, this is what it is. So, uh, this is going to be weird, but, uh, I'm going to give him a VCR tape. Yes. Uh, a VHS tape. I'm sorry. Yeah. And he got it. And Ben was like, you're glad I had a VCR. I had to go in my closet and dig for it. Uh, but it's, or, it's still or it never got the gig. Yeah. yeah. It still worked. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, and you got to think that that's a time where, you know, it was a lot more expensive to convert things and, you know, we didn't have GoPros laying around all that stuff. So, I mean, you use. Oh, dude, this was before free YouTube, (laughs) Facebook. I think even like Instagram was still like big at that time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I want to bring up your setup with Breaking Benjamin. Um. You said that you were utilizing the four piece. Did were you incorporating more on your left side with the percussion elements? I've noticed. 
Or do you know anything? Yeah, I mean, it, it varies. I like to try to switch it up a lot. Um, like, there's a great drummer named Marvin McQuitty who passed Gospel away God. many, many years. Yeah, yeah, amazing guy. Such yeah. a such an amazing human being. I, I but he, not, not to interrupt you, but I, I first found him yeah. on Modern Drummer 2005, the DVD. That's right. First, yeah, yeah, yeah. With Aaron Spears and Gerald and yeah. Teddy and all them. I watched that on rotation yeah. countless times. <laughs> he um, was actually really sick at that time, I believe. Oh wow! I, I think he had lupus or something. I can't remember, but. If you hear him in his heyday, like uh-huh. the rumor on the street from what I was told was Vinny Cayuta called him and said, I, I have to go do a gig. I want you to play for Sting. Oh, wow. When Vinny Cayuta recommends you to go and play a gig for him, you got to be a bad mofo. <laughs> yeah. Or a Josh Freese. Yeah. <laughs> um, or a Josh Freese. Yeah. So um, he got more into the ministry and doing like accounting and stuff uh-huh. for Fred Hammond, I believe. Uh-huh. And then, um, after he passed, you know, he will never be forgotten for real. Oh yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Great. interrupt Great. I just wanted to point out a way to find him pretty. He, he didn't, he fooled me. He didn't seem sick in that performance whatsoever. You would never know. Yeah. I know. So what were you saying about he influenced you to incorporate, um, the so he would, from what I was told when I worked at Guitar Center, oh, there was did. a guy named Rob Cozart. Oh, you worked there and, as well? <laughs> yeah. I worked there for uh, 12 years. Did you really? Yeah. Yeah, I actually worked there for about 12 to 13 years. Um, yeah, it was it was a, quite a ride. I mean, I, what what years were you working at Guitar Center? Oh, my gosh. Um, I think that was pre, pre-switched. So that was like, 1989 no 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 90 1998 i think so, yeah oh so you got the fun years in there before they went all corporate well that's what i'm saying they like when i went in training you had to take a test <laughs> yeah, i remember a little bit and of that. you know like they would train you and you would never ask hey can i help you at guitar center because the so the answer to that is no, I'm just looking. Yeah. Um, so you would have to say, and it would give you a list of things like just nonchalantly talk to a person coming in. Hey, how's the weather? Hey, are those snake skin boots? Where do you get those? <laughs> you know, it's like, who says that? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, pretty off the wall. I mean, I, for what it's worth, I learned a lot from, you know, the, the music industry. And like, yeah. I, I learned a lot about gear and getting hands-on stuff that, you know, I, I probably wouldn't have the opportunity. So I, there is, you know, it's some cool stuff that came out of it. I'm assuming you probably agree in some ways, but there was also the, the weird stuff. Oh, yeah, dude. I mean, they fired me so I could do the drum off. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I watched that video, actually. Um, I, I, yeah. yeah. Where I have a Nautica shirt tucked in. Yeah. yeah that's I, great. Yeah, that, I remember watching that years ago, right when YouTube was starting to kind of flow with that. that. That's pretty cool. Did you go work again for it after that? Um, I think I did it a y- year after. Nice. I could be- believe so. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And then um, we- yeah. Uh, and then we were talking about, uh, the, the, I'm sorry to go back to it. I was real curious. So when you started adding to your Breaking Benjamin setup, <laughs> Uh, on the left, what were you adding, like auxiliary snares or uh, blocks as well? Well, I never really played a side snare, uh-huh. ever. When I heard Breaking Ben, um, basically in like So Cold and Sooner or Later and stuff like that, there were side snares mm-hmm. and polyamorous. So I had to incorporate that into my arsenal. I mean, I've, you know, dicked around using a side snare as like a timbali thing, Uh um, for like reggae, Mm -hmm. but I never used it as like another snare drum per se. Yeah. So you Um, you weren't playing the downbeat on it. You were just accenting with it. Correct. Yeah. I, I play a lot of more, like you say, percussion stuff. 
uh-huh. in that uh, in that aspect. But like when I did the song "Breath," that's what I was going to bring up. Fill, <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> yeah, that fill uh-huh. became an accident. Really? Because I was trying to do like a so cold kind of thing where Jeremy incorporated that huh. side snare with the strainer off and that so cold fill in the second verse. I tried to do something like that with with uh, breath. Yeah, it's funny. That's the reason why I even brought up that question. That that song breath is. It's almost like a staircase feel, and I mean that in a good way. It feels like you're descending down, but you're actually playing high yeah. drums, and it, 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 it's perfect for that part. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember probably half of the stuff I played on the record because it was like, <laughs> I, I, when I did it right when I was writing with Ben in the basement, I had a gist of kind of what I was going to do, but when I recorded, nothing that I worked on really made it on the record, so I improvised a lot. Yeah, but one thing, uh, we'll leave that here in a second. Your kick patterns in that band were always locked in, though. That's one thing. I, I you know, Thank you. It's, it was well counted out. It was well locked in. And that's what I think led to that band's success. When you hear a radio song and it's locked in like that, that's when you know the drummer's on point. And that's what, that, that's what caught my attention with you in the first place. You know, guys like you and Morgan Rose are just always on top of it. Yeah, Morgan's got a great right foot. I mean, he's got two good feet. Yeah. Uh, with the double bass stuff that he does. He puts kicks in the weirdest spots, too. Yeah. But I always liked the way Morgan played, because he, he plays funky. Yeah. Um, And he's very musical with his hands, with, like, bell work and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, he plays like, those... Waffle and Denial and... Yeah, he, has, he, uses, and all those kind of... he uses those nine-inch deal bills. <laughs> you know, you can tell he tells that sound. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, I mean... At the, at that time, I was really into Morgan Rose, um, understanding the way he played, and what you do is great musicians are are good musicians borrow great musicians feel, mm-hmm. yeah. and I stole so much from everyone. Diary of Jane <laughs> is a Seven Dust ripoff from I think it's Terminator. From left to right, from <laughs> left to right, yeah. where it goes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do, yeah, and and then I stole that and made it Diary of Jane. Yeah, and I, that's I, that's why I was saying you two have similar sounds. And I didn't mean it in a, an insult way. I just I, I'm more of a compliment. I can totally tell you, you you know you listen to Seven Dust a little bit through that album. Oh yeah, I, I definitely looked up to Morgan at a earlier age in my rock or my metal mm-hmm. uh, because he didn't play like any. Uh, that's the one thing I look at for drummers mm-hmm. is how consistent and clean they are and what they sound different than the other drummer. Yeah. Like, can I hear them on a record and go, Oh, that's Morgan. Yeah. I can tell when Morgan plays on someone's record. Yeah. As soon as I hear the hi hats with him, I know it's him. Yeah. It's like we were talking about Stuart Copeland. Yeah. He's hands down my favorite drummer. One of the most underrated drummers, if you ask me, but the hi hat work Mm -hmm. is, is impeccable. Like, who did that in pop? So, are, let me ask you: Are you what size hi hats? I know you're a Pisces artist now, but what size hi hats are you using? So, Pisces. Pisces, there you go. I always say it differently. Everybody. Yeah, Pacey, Pisces, <laughs> comma, Hama, whatever. <laughs> um, but Pisces makes a lot of 14s. They don't make a lot of 13s. I've always played 13. Mm-hmm. So now I have no other choice. I have a pair of 13. Uh, dark crisp hat that I'm infatuated with. Oh, nice! But then I also have the Sound Edge Rude 14 hi hats, and you would think like Heavy. jazz funk guy playing Rude, yeah, dude. Be... I'm telling you, <laughs> lights out. <laughs> the best hi hats I've ever played in my life. Nice, nice. And that's as soon as you think Rude, you think Corn, you think like anthrax. exactly. You think of like, oh my gosh, this is trash can. Toxic metal. Yeah. Here we go. Anthrax. Like, but like, uh, they're very musical. There's not one bad symbol they make. Well, I want to back up. Um, you were a DW artist there for a long time, and you had that beautiful, yeah. beautiful exotic set. And Zildjian, what, 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 what kind of made you just switch? It's just more of a, um, you know, exploring the new territories, or just something you wanted to circle back to? Well, it all started with, you know, Camco, which is DW. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I got my first kit. And then my second kit was Tama, 
And then my third kit was the BLX Pearl. Okay. And then I bought, when my ex-wife bought me my first Yamaha kit before I signed with them, which is in that video oh, I for my know. audition. You played out. No, for my audition. For uh, my audition for Breaking Ben, the VHS one, it's a red. Um, uh, what was it? Virtual absolute. The, absolute, yeah. I believe. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And then I signed with Yamaha, and then I went to DW, and now I'm with Tama. Nice. And um, so I'm back to where like I started my first actual drum drum set. So, do, I noticed in your new setup, is it more modeled off the Imperial Star that Stuart was playing? Because you have the shallow toms on there as well. The what? Uh, it, I noticed on your newer Star Classic kit, it has the shallow toms on there. Was that more of like yeah. the, an Imperial Star that like uh, Stuart Copeland was playing? Yeah, I mean, I've always liked shallow depth. That's what you yeah, um, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, because to me, they're quicker. Mm-hmm. They don't resonate as long. They get in and get out. Nice. And no one wants to hear cattle falling down the hill every five <laughs> bars, you know? Yeah, yeah I agree. So, um, so the less I can get away with it, you know? And then one thing before we jump ahead in that, uh, going to Black Label, uh, how was that of a change to your setup? And, you know, were you, were you hitting harder? Or did it feel more dynamically different? Playing with someone like that? No, I mean, it, it definitely, that is a man's gig. Um, <laughs> Zach is probably hands down one of my favorite guys to work for. I imagine. Um, such a pro guy, such a funny guy, such a great heart, and will always compliment you, um, which I didn't have in the previous band. And just a little bit of just saying, hey, you're killing it today, bro, or you're doing such a great job, makes you go 110% for that person. Yeah, just being recognized. Just yeah, it goes a long way by just an act of kindness every day to somebody. Mm -hmm. And he was that kind of guy. He was a hired gun. He knew that job with Ozzy. Mm -hmm. And uh, Zach is a running oiled machine. And there's a certain sound, a certain identity, color. Like I didn't want black. He wanted me to get black. I'm like, dude, you got purple and orange guitars. (laughs) That ain't metal. Yeah, you know. Why, why do I have to get black? So I went with a DW marble finish, uh-huh. which is like a black and gray swirl, it's like a, which was a, nice. A black marine pearl, basically. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So did you find yourself playing bigger kicks or bigger floor toms in that project? I played two up, three down, three oh, floor toms. Really? And a 22 by 18. Nice. And a 14 by six and a half snare. And a plethora of symbols. Yeah. And then rehearsed- bigger symbols too, nineteen crashes. Now, and eighteen. Now, did you feel like you had to kick in more endurance in a gig like that? Or is it more like rehearsal and eccentric, you know, with the weights and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean there was a song called Godspeed Hellbound. And that was probably the most intense, fast double bass through the whole show uh-huh. for like an hour and a half. Oh, wow. And it was more like he was trying to, when Will Hunt played the drums, he was trying to do like a Rammstein kind of real robotic. Mm-hmm. And when I did it, I just act like I'm running from the cops and stole a TV. <laughs> yeah. And just keep my feet going as fast as I possibly can. And was he, up, um, was he playing with a click or was it more uh, free flowing? No, he won't, he won't let me. Really? He said, you are a click. Yeah. That's so, awesome. um, I'm a big fan of playing to a click. And the reason I'm a fan of playing to a click is there's no debating, yeah. man. It felt slow. It felt, it felt fast today. It's like, Oh, well you just pick one or the other drummers know where we should be mm-hmm. tempo wise yeah. because our arms and legs can play what it plays. I've done some theory on why drummers and, and I have to give credit to David Bendis, our producer that did breaking Ben. I never thought of it like this, but when we do a fill from our smallest tom to our lowest floor tom, Mm -hmm. okay, your hands are naturally going to slow down at the last drum. Mm -hmm. 
that's just the nature of the beat because it's lower tuning and a, and a lower frequency, right? Mm -hmm. It takes a longer time for your ear to hear that frequency than hearing an eight inch drum. Mm -hmm. So when you do a fill, you almost have to play the floor tom ahead to make it sound in time. So when David would say, I want you to play through a fill, I'm like, what does that even mean? Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. And what he means is start here and push at the last part. That will keep you in time because that tom, that floor tom that resonates because it's looser tuning mm -hmm. is going to take longer to be put through the microphone. Yeah. yeah so you are that was food for thought. Yeah. Yeah. So yep. one, that's, that's a really good idea. I, I, I'll think a little bit more about that one. Um, as far as your practice routine, that's where I have a lot of respect to you. Um, do you mandate yourself to practice like a time frame a day or do you, you write out your practice routines or how do you go about doing that? Um, you know, when I was younger, I would play eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. I mean, there would be times where my mom would bring my dinner upstairs. <laughs> uh, but nowadays I don't play as much like eight hours a day. I'll practice like an hour or two hours a day. Mm -hmm. Um, because practice is something that's challenging you. Mm -hmm. Practice is not putting on your favorite songs and jamming to them. Yeah. That is not practice. That's called fun. Yeah. Pra practicing is something that's challenging your mind. Yeah. Studying. Pushing you to the point where you're throwing sticks at the wall. Yeah. And that's what I do. So I do this thing named, uh, this sorry, that name, uh, this concept that Chris Coleman came up with when I bought his DVD many, many moons ago. Mm -hmm. It's called the ABC method. Now, my problem is I have ADD all day drumming constantly. <laughs> and my tension span is like a walnut. Uh -huh. So this routine really helps me focus. So, for instance, you play, let's say, eight hours. Mm-hmm. You're jamming to your favorite song. What did you get done? Okay, you can play your favorite record. But did you learn how to play to a click? No. Did you study reading? Did you work on any rudiments? No. You spent that eight hours jamming to songs. Mm -hmm. So Chris Coleman came up with this ABC method. And let's, let's take them in increments of 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. The A section, C, uh, B section, and C section. Mm -hmm. 10 minutes for each section. So 10 minutes, let's practice two rudiments, a single and a double at, mm -hmm. at different subdivisions. Mm -hmm. Okay. That 10 minutes is up. You got to move on to the next exercise, no matter what, no matter if you're grooving and it's starting to work and everything's flowing, mm -hmm. you got to move the next 10 minutes. You practice to a metronome. Maybe playing those rudiments to a metronome or just playing pocket to a metronome. Mm -hmm. After that 10 minutes, you do another project. So that half hour, you have done three things that have challenged you than just playing eight hours of one song. Yeah. So it, it keeps you, your brain in a loop, pretty much. Not in a loop, but just jumping off. It, it pushes you. Yeah. It pushes you and motivates you to, to basically hone in and stay the course. Um, the, the ongoing joke is, you know how many, uh, ADD people it takes to change a light bulb? I don't know how many. You want to ride a bike? What's that? I said, you want to ride bikes? Yeah. That's the joke. How many ADD people does it take to change a light bulb? Oh, gotcha. <laughs> you want to ride bikes? Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I misunderstood you there. That's good. Yeah. So. That's what the problem with ADD people is we can't focus on one thing. Yeah. We yeah. do a, a multiple of many things and not get one thing done. So this ABC method is getting three things accomplished and more done in a half hour than you would have done eight hours doing one thing. Yeah. And, I, and when I watch you play, you seem very focused. So I mean, this is a compliment. You wouldn't come off that way being ADD. You know, you always seem like you're really locked in. You know what you're doing. That's kind of a I'm a good actor. 
<laughs> so it's a very it's, um, it's a surprise it's a surprise to hear you say that because I, when I watched you, I just feel like this guy he he just he, he's on the clock. He's doing it, you know. I'm a, believe it or not, bro. I'm a slow learner. Really, and yeah, it takes me a long time to learn something. Um, and it's just because of my brain. Mm. It, it can do more complex stuff than easy stuff. Mm -hmm. So if I was playing a Breaking Ben beat, just jamming a song with Ben's riff, he would say, try this. And I could never get it. Because when I'm put on the spot in front of four other guys or three other guys staring at me, mm -hmm. I freeze up. Oh. And my brain just shuts down and the hamster smoking a cigarette in the wheel is not turning my brain. Oh, wow. And so it like just goes one ear and out the other. And they're like, come on, bro. It's just boop, boop, ka. And I, and they're like, how can you play like Russian tool and stuff effortless, <laughs> but you can't do that. And I go, I don't know. That's the way God made me. I, I, that's, you know, and you have to learn that like people that have autism and stuff like that, they're not dumb. Mm -hmm. They're just doing things differently than the normal person. They can do stuff more complex than we will ever Fathom. Well, the brain's a sponge. It just has different ways of sponging things up. That's the way I always kind of looked at it. Correct. They're great with numbers. Uh huh. Um, and so you you have to find what you're good at, how you learn, and use that to your ability. Uh -huh. And if someone makes fun of you, well, shame on them. You know, I mean, everyone plays differently. Everyone looks different. Everyone walks, talks, and everything differently. So just because that person can do it quicker doesn't mean they're better. No, not at all. My memory, I've been super blessed to have a memory to this day of being almost 44 that I still remember stuff that I played in Breaking Ben that I couldn't play and now I can play it effortless. Mm -hmm. Like hopeless. I'll tell people, I have no problem saying this. The drum beat in the course is not me. It's programmed. Really? I couldn't play it. It was too busy. <laughs> it was too much. The only thing is me playing the verse and the bridge. But when you hear the bridge, you can hear how much more it grooves mm -hmm. and the chorus is more robotic. Yeah. I don't play straight eighth notes on the bell all the time like that. Huh. Like, dee, 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 dee. Uh, no way. <laughs> well, that's a... Uh... Going into another, uh, that, uh, are you still giving clinics and lessons as well? Yeah, when the pandemic yeah. decides to, to leave town. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. I, do, I do teach at home, mm -hmm. um, trying to be a safe, I, I only have literally like maybe three students now, mm -hmm. um, but I do Skype nice. all over the world. Nice. Um, and I do. I love doing drum clinics. The last one I did was at Berkeley. Oh wow! Um, many many years ago, master class. Which no pressure there. You can't like <laughs> BS your way to <laughs> drummers there. No, that's like right. here's a paradiddle, and the guy's gonna raise his hand and be like, "Excuse me, sir, but that's wrong." Of course, it's wrong because <laughs> you go to Berkeley. Yeah, you know, you're so. under a microscope. Under a microscope on that one. Oh my gosh, bro! It was, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you want to like. I looked like a deer in headlights when I was there because it was really packed there. And there was like four concerts going on. Really? So the, yeah. So the, uh, people on the faculty were like, they were really impressed on how many people came to see me play. Mm -hmm. So that was already nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. And then rumor on the street was my drum teacher teaches there. Oh, wow. And his name was Neil Smith. He was a jazz drummer. And this guy was like whiplash. Like he almost fought me one night <laughs> at, at, uh, at um, a drum lesson because he basically, I, he charged me for the first couple months and then stopped charging me. Uh -huh. But I was on his dime, on his own time. Uh -huh. So I would do stuff for him to help him out or something when he was in college. He was about to graduate. Long story short, I came there one night, waited five hours. He was coming back from, you know, doing some work from school. And he's like, bro, if you don't got your lesson, we're fighting in the parking lot. And I was like, <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> this is supposed to be a learning experience, not a life experience. <laughs> so, 
you know, he was really hard on me and I really needed that ass whipping at a young age. And then I found out they're like, yeah, I study with Neil. And I went, uh, what, what do you mean? Neil? Yeah. He teaches here, dude. I thought he was literally going to come in and like put me on the spot and be like, Chad, play two A from stick control. I'd be like, Oh my God, here we go. You're checking I'm getting, off. I'm getting my, yeah. Master class you know, and this guy's going to take it over, you know? So, well, you guys take that pretty face fun. value. Anyone giving a clinic at Berkeley is an extraordinary what they do. So I, I would totally take it in a good way as well. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was, um, definitely something that I'll never forget. A, a good friend of mine named Steve Forrest, uh, their two kids, well now three, uh, went to Berkeley mm-hmm. and, um, he, talk to the people about having me come and they were all about it. So kudos and props to them. Nice. Nice. And so if, if someone were to want to take online lessons, what would be the best way to reach you? Uh, my email, C H A D S Z as in zebra E L I G A. Okay. I'll, at gmail.com. And I'll put that in the link there for you. So if anyone wants to send them, please. Us, yeah. Thank I'll, you. Yeah, I'll, do, I'll definitely do that for you. Uh, back to your endorsements. I just wanted to ask, is there any gear that you're looking forward to trying out with Tama and Pisces that you're looking to try out pretty soon here? I just had, I haven't really showed it off yet. I have a custom ride that they made for me. Really? Um, in a color. Yeah. And it's like a, a one-off just for me. Really? And, uh, I want to try to talk to them about doing it as a signature model because it destroys the earth ride. Really? Destroys it. So yeah. when you say earth ride, are you, are you talking about a real thick, you know, ride is what you're looking for? No. It it sounds like that and it's really deceiving. It you think it weighs like forty pounds. <laughs> That's pretty heavy. <laughs> I'm playing I'm playing a, it, I'm playing a twenty four inch uh, two thousand two right now on mine. Okay. Yeah. It's basically a mega bell souped up. Huh. It looks like a big boob with a nipple. <laughs> yeah, those are uh, twenty. Remember the two thousand? I mean, uh, the twenty-two inch uh, Mega Z Bell. Those were hard to come by back in the day. Yeah, it's like that, but a, a rude version with a custom paint job. And um, what color do you do? I, I want to call. I got it purple. Nice, nice, nice. That's pretty cool. I'm gonna call it the Resurrection Ride. Oh, that's pretty cool. Hey, I know Steer Club yeah. has the, the, you have a picture of the Steer Club and ride on your, uh, yeah, I, I love that ride until I got this ride and <laughs> it's so versatile. You can still crash it and it doesn't sound like a gong, like an earth ride. Uh huh. Um, and the bell, if, if you miss the bell, you got problems. That's all I can say. <laughs> like Stevie wonder could hit this thing. <laughs> so before I let you go, I want to talk about your current projects with uh, Black Star Writers. How's that going for you right now? And what was the other one you were currently doing? Uh, Weapons of a New. And how, uh, what's going on with those guys right now? What's the best place to listen to those? Um, so we're kind of not doing anything with Black Star Writers. Ricky's doing his own solo project, so we wish him uh, the best in his oh uh, career. In that sorry. yeah, no, sorry. no, no. no. Uh, he's doing that. So in March, I, well, in February, I built a, a mini studio in my basement and praise God for that because this pandemic just came out of nowhere mm-hmm. and put us all out of business. And I've been doing more work in my basement studio recording drums. Mm-hmm. I did it in March with weapons of a new, I got a call and they said, what are you doing right now? The producer, and I know the producer from previous things. And I said, nothing. He's like, well, obviously we can't go to the studio, but do you have like something you could re- or where you could record? I said, yeah, matter of fact, I record in my basement. And so long and behold, now I'm in this band called Weapons of a New, and we have a single called Sick Boy, which is doing really well on uh, radio and Spotify. So people go up to Spotify and go to our Instagram, like, and subscribe. And what we're going to be doing pretty soon is we're going to hopefully do a drum set, cymbals, drum head, stick. We have two ESP guitars, Mesa boogie, and a plethora of other stuff. And we're going to do a, a basically a raffle. Whoever likes and subscribes to our social media, we're going to do, you know, a, a raffle. Oh, nice. And people will win 
some really good gear, like wow. really good gear before Christmas with this pandemic. A lot of people can't afford that for their kids. So all they got to do is like, and subscribe and follow us on our social media stuff. And they can be put in a, you know, a raffle. Yeah. I'll happily uh, share the links for that as well too. So can I help you guys there? Yeah. But the, hopefully the new year, uh, will open up and, and we can start taking this band weapons of a new out because it's definitely a force to reckon with. I mean, they're, they're great guys, great musicians. Um, and I just brought my guitar player walking with lions into weapons of a new, Oh, nice. his name's Ke- Kevin Hicklin still doing the, uh, walking with lions. Just we're kind of like on break right now and, and concentrating on, doing the weapons uh-huh. and um, that's my full-time gig now and I'm really looking forward to the future with these guys and you know ready to play some great music and for the world to hear it yeah that's awesome like I said I'll get the links out there I'm gonna check it out as soon as we're done here but uh Chad yeah I think I think you'll dig it uh the record we don't know when the record's coming out yet um because the world today like bring me the horizons one of my favorite bands I've been really getting into. A mantra is uh, a cool song. <laughs> yeah, and their new record's great. And they're, they put out like three or four songs already. Mm-hmm. You know, nowadays it's singles. Yeah, YouTube singles. No one, yeah, no one really buys actual CDs or records or, or this or that. They just stream it. So we just put out one song and we're going to try to milk it and see how well it does. And, um, we have a great team supporting it. That's, that's working it at radio and everything. So we're super blessed for that and super blessed that you would take the time and allow me to do this, this podcast. And oh, no, the honor's on me, man. <laughs> like I said, I've been looking up to you for a, quite a few years now. And just the, the idea that you were willing to do it, like blew me away. And, and this show's new. We, we've been doing this show for about a little over three months, and I've had some incredible drummers on so far, like yourself. So it's going pretty good, and I really appreciate you doing this. Yeah, dude. Yeah, I saw that Kevin Miller did it, and he's from my neck of the I'm not like close, close by, but he's in PA. Oh, nice. And he's a great, guy, great guy. Yeah, and I, I have some great pretty, drummers, some pretty cool ones coming up, like yourself as well. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, Chad, thanks for being here today. Um, I'm gonna put the links out there for you. Uh, anyone you want to give a shout out to any students or uh, any other bands so we can give a shout out to? I just give a shout out to everyone, you know, and <laughs> sorry to put you just on the spot. Stay, yeah. <laughs> just to stay safe and to be kind to one another. And, you know, hopefully we'll all get through this together and we can get back out there. And I know the world is dying for live music. I mean, yes. I don't care if you're in a fog hat tribute band, it's going to be sold out once everything <laughs> opens up, <Yeah. laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it don't, it doesn't really matter if you're Kimmy's Jimmy, you know, shark shack, it, it, whatever band is going to be packed yeah. because people are, you know, piss and vinegar ready to raise <laughs> hell, uh, yeah, my... without a mask on, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, this is a real thing. I, I'm a big conspiracy theorist on a lot of things, oh, but yeah, yeah. I've had I've, I've had friends that have had it, and I've had friends that say, "I don't know what they're talking about. It's not that bad." And then I had friends that almost died from it. Mm-hmm. So it, it's like hot potato. You don't know if you're going to get the hot potato, and you're out. Yeah, you know, no, um, you don't even know if you had it's it. Scary. You know what I mean? It's it's a very scary thing. I mean, it, it's a reality that. Dude, I don't even go out much, but when I do and I'm wearing a mask, like my wife and I went to go, we've been getting into carving pumpkins (laughs) and, uh, I've been really getting into it. So I bought like foam pumpkins. Uh I carved like a bunch of different characters, like jaws and stuff and put them outside Uh and the squirrels ate them and I flipped (laughs) like five hours of carving (laughs) and these things, 10 minutes devour it. No, no can do. So we've been carving pumpkins and I've been finding an, uh, another art, another hobby of, you know, cause everything to me is still helping drumming. Yeah. Keeping your, keeping your you hands know, moving. You keep your hands moving, you get motivated, you don't get burned out, you know, and drumming is supposed to be fun, mm-hmm. but it also is work. Yeah. And 
you know, doing these kind of things and inspiring people from our stories and stuff like that. Hey, I'm Chad Saliga from a town called Elyria, Ohio. Mm -hmm. If I can do this, anybody can do it as cliche as that sounds. Mm -hmm. And I try to give people, uh, the drive to push for their dreams because it can be a reality. You just got to push hard enough and you have to learn to take some else. Yes. But never give up. Well, yeah, you definitely motivated me, like I was saying. So, like, I appreciate everything Thank you've done. You. And, you know, just in the YouTube channel, that's another thing I want to talk about is checking out. What's the name of your YouTube channel there? Uh, It's just Chad Saliga. Yeah, and I've been uh, stalking that for the last couple of days. And I've learned just a lot just watching you from that. So I highly recommend anyone go check that out if they haven't already and subscribe. But. I'm going to let you go there, Chad. If you enjoyed the show, yeah. um, we're going to be on YouTube, Apple, Spotify. Please share with your friends and subscribe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, and, and have a uh, blessed day. Let me tell you guys about the stuff called Groove Juice. The stuff is amazing. I've been using it since honestly I can remember. It's kept my drums and cymbals looking pristine for shows or just simply practicing at home. Most drummers and some of the great drum techs around the world use this stuff and proudly endorse it. Please reach out to your local retailer. Or order online with Group Juice.